We are talking Indianapolis Colts football on the Our Lads Football Network here on the Our Lads Football YouTube channel. And when we talk Indianapolis Colts football, that means we welcome in Kent Sterling from the Kent Sterling YouTube channel. How's it going, Kent? Good, Greg. How are you doing? I'm doing good. So uh, Colts fans, how are they doing? I know it's been a little while, uh, you know, and everybody's kind of already looking at uh, mini camps and OTAs and all that kind of stuff in the rear view. And I'm sure there's been a lot of news at your camp, just like every other NFL team camp. But still, uh, we never got an opportunity to catch up. And I definitely wanted to make sure we did that because we're, we'll be talking in the next month or two during preseason and training camp. And we'll set everybody up. Uh, Colts fans, don't forget, subscribe here to the channel because Ken will be back to, pre to uh, preview the season. But uh, even though it's a little bit late, I, I definitely wanted to spend some time talking to you about the draft. Sure. And, and, and fans, Colts fans are always hopeful. And we spent a lot of time being hopeful between 2001 and about 2014. And with all but one season, uh, we were right to be hopeful. And so, you know, yeah. cynicism comes hard to this fan base. And after we got through the malaise of free agency, because Battle just doesn't engage in it, we had the draft. And we feel pretty good about things right now because Anthony Richardson is trending toward health. And and that's a good thing. Yeah, and it's uh, it's, it's even if you just follow the last couple of drafts uh, with the organization with Ballard and who they pick, especially the top picks, it's pretty obvious the type of uh, athletes, uh, the type of uh, big time uh, performers with huge upsides that uh, have been taken by this organization with Richardson last year, a lot to and Mitchell uh, with the first couple of picks this year. Um, matter of fact, eight of the first nine, eight of the nine picks by the Colts were power five FBS players. Is that normal for Ballard, uh, to go after, to, to not necessarily try to go too much into the pool of FCS, uh, you know, lower level FBS, uh, or was this just a one-off this year? I think it's kind of a one-off. I mean, they've done that. Grover Stewart was from Albany state. Kenny Moore was from Valdosta state. Yeah, although he wasn't drafted, they signed him as uh, a, a guy that the Patriots cast off. They'll go out and they'll get guys without uh, a, a big college pedigree if they're the right guy. This year, it just worked out that uh, you know the right guys were big college guys. All right. Well, our uh, the R Lads draft review guide isn't out. Uh, matter of fact, I think it, it it probably could be in the next day or two. So. Uh, this is actually a perfect time to do a show like this. This is last year's, obviously. Uh, look, look who remember, of course, who we picked last year. Uh, all Colts fans, you got the, you got your boy here, uh, Anthony Richardson. I have no idea who they picked for the 2024 draft. Um, so, uh, if you want to get that, don't forget to go to rlads.com and check out uh, the draft review guide. And you can also check out this year's uh, draft guide, uh, which is of course available right now. And even though it's a couple of months after the draft. This is still a great time to get it because you'll know exactly which players are on the Colts. You can zero in on their scouting reports as well as all the other, I mean, 95% of the other players that were drafted are in this draft guide. So check that out. Um, let's go ahead though, Kent, and start off, of course, talking about the Colts and their draft. And let's talk about, uh, we'll start at the top uh, with their edge rusher. What did you think about, uh, getting Latu where they did when he was still on the board and uh, the Colts were up. Uh, was that the player or one of the players that you expected him to go after? It was not. And I was really, I was disappointed to the point of anger until they went in the second round and took A.D. Mitchell at 52. Then it all kind of fit together. <laughs> I wanted a receiver in the first round. I wanted him to go after somebody who could catch a football and be dynamic with it. And and so at 15, I thought, what are you doing? You got Quiddy Pay, you took Dio Odangbo, you, you have Samson Ebicom, who came in last year as a free agent, did good work. Taekwon Lewis, I mean, my God, how many edge rushers do we need? <laughs> but you need an elite one. And and when they were able to get Mitchell at 52, I think it kind of saved uh, Chris Ballard's bacon. I, I think that that was just really, really fortunate that they were able to get a guy with the athleticism, the size, the dynamis dynamism uh, <laughs> of, of uh, Mitchell 
as yeah. as they drafted in the second round because the first I wasn't really thrilled with. But as you get to know Leatu Latu a little bit, you do get excited about him. And when you talk to you know his position coach, and you talk to uh, Gus Bradley a little bit, the defensive coordinator, and you realize where Latu is in terms of his development you realize that maybe this is a bit of a unicorn type guy and there's a land rush on offensive players and be able to get a guy like Latu despite his neck injury in college and the fact that he had to retire when he was in college at one point, maybe this winds up being a steal in the draft. Yeah, uh, because I'm just taking a look at our notes uh, when we previewed the offseason, including the draft. And so again, so this was before free agency. And you're you 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 said you were pretty close between one and four, but for the most part, you thought it should be corner, safety, receiver, and then edge. Yes. Now they did go after, of course, the DBs that we're going to talk about, even though they did it later in the draft. And I'm only talking about the draft because, again, this is fr- this is a free agency. But uh, overall, uh, they did not make any significant moves in free agency as well in the defensive backfield. So. Um, what, so again, as far as the edge rusher being part of your top five as maybe your fourth biggest need, do you feel that with, with Latu now on board and him a part of the unit that they are as set as they need to be this season at edge? Yeah, I do. And, and let me go back a little bit about the cornerback and safeties. They still have a need at those positions, but this, the cornerback position in this draft was so deep that I thought at 15, I didn't think it was going to be a waste, but I thought you would get a cornerback at 15 that maybe you could get at 40. And and so the disparity between the the corners that you'd be that would be available at 15 and then later wouldn't be that great. And so you could earmark a guy kind of down draft to go play corner. I still think they need a free safety. I don't think they address that at all. I think that the safety that and really uh, the safety that they that they took is going to be applied to the linebacker position. Can't yep. play safety, yep. so you're kind of dancing with the with the girls that brung you last year, and that didn't go very well for the Colts. So I don't think that they wound up addressing either of those needs. Um, but I, I think that the most pressing need that you like nobody's going to let Justin Jefferson go. You're, you're not going to get a great wide receiver in free agency because nobody allows them to leave their organization or very rarely do they. So I, I think the draft is your way to do that. And I think with a guy like A.D. Mitchell available at 52, uh, it, it just kind of made everything fit together. So were you hoping for like Mitchell or Arnold? Was that where you were kind of going at the time? Did you think that that's probably where you thought they were going to go since they were both available? I'm I talking maybe Mitchell the corner. Uh, I, I thought with wide receiver, you trade up from 15 and you get one of the big three. Harrison okay. was going to be okay. gone, but one of the other two at Dunze, that would have been fine by me. Yeah. Um, so I thought that maybe they would be able to do that. I thought if you were going to go like Terry and Arnold, I thought that maybe you could trade back trade and back. have access yeah. to somebody who would would fit. But if if they're right about Latu and and Latu, you can't tell a whole lot in a lot of positions when you go to mini camp or a rookie mini camp or the OTAs. But you can see some traits in Latu where you feel like, all right, you know what, maybe at 15, given that we got a wide receiver with traits at 52, maybe this guy winds up being the person who can put enough pressure on the quarterback quickly enough to kind of mitigate the need at corner or at free safety. Does that yeah, make that, sense? Absolutely. And that's that's usually the way you look at it sometimes. If you can't have your, your uh, what is the term, your, your cake, and uh, you can't have your, what is it, your... Your, I oh, come on, it's that easy one. You can't have your, you can't have your cake and eat it too, or, or you can't have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. Pie, I'll take both. I, I don't know. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's and that's basically what it is with these NFL teams is that they figure, well, if you if if you can't, then which most times you can't, like you said, if you have a really good front and you're a little weak back there, but the player is clearly better on the board up front, you do that. And you try to make sure that you maximize, even double down on your edge rushing and your pressure up front to compensate 
for the back. So yeah, I completely understand where you're coming from there. Um, and we talked about the fact that some of these kids might not even be around next year as why you need to take a look at the edge rusher situation. Um, and of course, talking right. about the 221, uh, 2021 draft picks, um, which makes this a very big season for Quiddy Pay. So, um, but in general, I take a look at that defensive front now for the Colts. And if everything works out, especially a lot to, of course, that's the big prize. Uh, it looks like it might be one of the more impressive, uh, you know, front walls that the Colts have had in several years. Yeah, I think one through eight, they are. And, and even one through nine. Yeah, uh, Taven Bryan is a guy that I, I didn't think played very well last year. But Charlie Partridge, who's a new D-line coach, thinks that Brian's got all kinds of kind of upside. And the player that he was in his second year at Jacksonville is kind of the player that the Colts and Partridge expect him to be this year. And that would be a lift for them. But what, what they really want, what Ballard, what Steichen, what Bradley really covet is to have kind of line changes. They, they want to go eight deep with starter level yeah. defensive linemen. And, and that's, you can argue that that's kind of where they are. You know, you do have four edges who can get to the quarterback. And then at the defensive tackle position, you do have Buckner and Stewart. And there's nothing wrong with that. You do have oh. Tate and Brian. And, and then you're, you're not going to want to rely on Eric Johnson for too much. But you can slide Tyquan Lewis inside a little bit. Odangbo can slide inside, play some tackle, especially on passing downs. And, and so you wind up being in a situation where with that defensive line, you could be multiple depending on the week and the matchups. Yeah. And, um, and then what did you think about the addition of Davis, Raekwon Davis? I, I forgot about Raekwon Davis. You're right. Dolphins guy. I think he's a really good depth piece. And he's the, he's the part of the, the formula that was missing last year when, when Grover Stewart got suspended. You had Tate and Bryant who could get to the quarterback a little bit. But with Brian on the field, you're really at a disadvantage in stopping the run. Raquan okay. Davis puts you in a position where you you got a run stopper. I mean, you look you look out on the field, no TAs, and there ain't no question which guy Raquan Davis is. He is a yeah. he's a monolith. He is huge. Uh, right now, I take a look at the. Um, because you, once you come out of uh, the top pick, and again, we talked about not adding anybody in the secondary and free agency. And I look and I say, well, of course, Davis was the big get. Um, but they also added a kid in the seventh round. A lot of times these things don't work out, but sometimes they do. They added um, – now, Now I don't know. It, it, it looks like the uh, Colts have him, or at least our lads, uh, the depth chart you're looking at there, the viewers are looking at there. That's the our lads depth chart for the Colts. Has him at defensive tackle. Um, he's got experience on the edge. Um what have you heard so far about why they drafted this kid and whether or not he has a chance to make the team? Well, down draft, they go for athletic trades. And Laulu has athletic trades. He is a fast defensive tackle. He doesn't have a lot of size. He's going to be able to get after guys. He's going to be able to kind of pursue guys. Seventh round, they're going to draft upside, and that's what they've done. Terrific athletic traits not necessarily an outstanding projection. And, and that's why he went in the seventh round. But in the seventh round, or if he'd have gone into undrafted free agency, he would have been a coveted cat. I mean, he can get after people. And they they drafted a guy whose name I'm going to just kill. And it was last year. He's on Northwestern. Everybody calls him Tommy. It's oh, yeah. uh, a Tomawa. Good heavens. Well, I can't even see Adibore? that. Adibore? Adibore? Adibore. Yeah, Adi right. And he can do the same thing. He, there's not a lot of ballast there, but he's very fast. And he's a guy who can chase people down from the defensive tackle position. Not something that necessarily you really want in a defensive tackle. Nobody goes after defensive tackles because they're incredibly mobile. And yeah. they can chase guys down on the sidelines. You know, they want guys who can stop up the line and stop yeah. people as they try to get through it. But Tommy is, is a guy in Laulu is another guy with those athletic traits. And, and again, down draft, the Colts covet those. And I think we had mentioned this before. Uh, our One of our lead scouts at our lad, Dave Syverson, really likes Tommy. And um, so that's, uh, again, yeah, so I don't know. I know he didn't get a chance last year, but he's a rookie. 
We'll see if he can make the big jump this year. Uh, let's stay on defense and talk about those those three players in the secondary. So it, it, you had to wait uh, through the offseason, free agency, and then finally some action in the defensive backfield uh, by adding, uh, even though, uh, I tell you what, we'll, we'll, we'll just mention uh, uh, Jalon uh, right. because he was a safety. Now, like you said, he's going to convert to linebacker. We'll get back to him. But at the other safety, Jalen Simpson. Now, I could see that he played his first several years at corner, switched to safety last year. Our lads has him right now as a corner. Um, and then they drafted Micah Abraham in round six, the other corner. So what did they see in Simpson, and, and why do they like him better at corner if that's a spot you think that he's going to end up playing? Simpson is a guy, and, and this is true for Juju Brents, and it's true for Jalen Jones also, the guys who project right now to be the, the starters at corner, depending on the health of Dallas Flowers. These are guys who can play press and be successful playing press. They are tough to get away from on the line. What, what you can't do with Simpson is the same thing you can't do with Brents and can't do with Jones is set him back 10 yards and give all that cushion. And every once in a while, Gus Bradley likes to do this. Sometimes he doesn't play press. He plays corners off. And if you're going to play Simpson off, he's going to get beat because he can't flip his hips really well. He, he does run the 40, but, uh, you know, being a corner, running the 40 only matter, matters in doing it fast when you've got your hips pointed in the right direction. If you're slow in the hips, slow at flipping your hips, it's really tough to change direction and and not be at an enormous disadvantage as you let a wide receiver who's really good at it, knowing where he's going, get away from you. So hopefully Simpson, Brent, Jones, those guys are employed as press guys because then that also helps with, with your pass rush. If you're going to give a 10-yard cushion, they're in the defensive end in the league who's going to get to the quarterback before he delivers the ball. Yeah, You know, you, you're going to see a guy throw a five-yard slant and the ball's out immediately. Nobody's going to get to him. If you press, then you can jam up the timing of a route to the point where a guy like Latour or a guy like Pay is going to be able to get to the quarterback. So hopefully, you know, the, the Colts really, as you look at them, they remind me a little bit of the Oakland A's in Moneyball when Billy Bean's talking to Art Howe about, look, if you don't play, play this team the way I built this team, it's just not going to work. And if Gus Bradley doesn't utilize the defensive pieces that have been gathered by Chris Ballard appropriately, I, I, I think that this, this defense could be exposed. And all of a sudden, you got a defensive coordinator on the hot seat. You know, you would have thought that, especially because we talked about Ballard potentially being on the hot seat. And you would think that because of that, well, it, this, if, if there's going to be a draft where you're going to make sure that the players that are on the field this year are going to work with the coaches and their schemes. This better be the year that that happens because you may not be around the next year. Uh, so it's not about how you used to draft when you first got here and you thought about the future and all. Like, oh, who knows? We'll make sure that my players and they'll fight the right coach to work with my players. Now it should be how do we work together because we might both be gone out of here if we don't make this work this year. Well, one's going to go beyond the other, or before the other. Like Chris Ballard isn't going to say, you know, Gus, you're not playing the players the way I drafted them to be played, so I'm going to resign. Like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gus is going to be gone if, if Gus doesn't play this team and, and utilize the tools that he's got in the way that they were designed. Uh, Chris Ballard has shown one really, really important quality as a general manager through his, now he's in year eight. He is a survivor. Ryan Grigson in five years never had a losing record. He was 11 and five, three times. He was eight and eight twice. Chris Ballard has gone to the playoffs exactly twice. He's won one playoff game. And, and he, the Ursays still love Chris Ballard. And that, that's Jim Ursay and that's Carly Ursay as well. Love Chris Ballard as a general manager. That requires some tact and some ability to set your agenda, communicate it, and have the ownership believe in it. And, and I think that Ballard, that's why he's not on the hot seat. That's why he's still got a job. 
Colts, in those seven seasons that, that Ballard's been the GM, they've not hosted a playoff game or won an AFC South title. Yeah. In the five years Grigson was here, he won two AFC South titles and went to an AFC championship game. And he was so repellent that he was fired after that for that fifth season. Ballard knows how to survive. And his survival this year might require kind of taking a look at Gus Bradley and saying, you know what, we're going to we're going to do this a little bit differently. And Gus is going to have to go do something else. Or like you said, there's going to be a meeting of the minds and these guys are going to be a little more synergistic than maybe they've been the last two years when that Colts defense has ranked 28th both years in points against. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, re- I what I recall was uh, what, what was the big uh, issue and, and why they moved on uh, and added in uh, Ballard was because they had real uh, bad cap issues that they were, they were giving out contracts to players that they were overpaid. It just felt like, and then he comes in and, and kind of, you know, really did a good job of putting them back into a reasonable, this is how contracts are done kind of deal. Again, I might be wrong, but this is whatever call of why, because again, you're talking about a, a GM that had a lot of quality production on the field wins loss wise what, what do you recall? Or of course, obviously you're covering the team. What was the main reason between why they went from one GM to the other and why Ballard actually looked like at least early on in his career, that things were working out well for them. Well, the one thing that happened with Ryan Grigson is he went 11 and five, 11 and five, 11 and five. And in that third season, they went to the AFC championship game. Grigson went out in the offseason, was very active in free agency, signing guys okay. like Frank Gore and Andre Johnson. And like he went to work trying to cover up the holes that, that that team had in order to put them in a Super Bowl conversation. And so at the end of free agency, after the 14th season and before the 15th season, a lot of national media were saying the Colts are the sexy Super Bowl team. And when you establish an expectation like that, I don't know whether it works this way with all 32 ownership groups, but I know that when Jim Ursay has that as an expectation, and then all of a sudden that expectation, poof, turns into 8-8, not going into the playoffs, you got a real problem on your hands. Ursay was patient, gave Grigson another year after this famous, at least locally it's famous, this press conference, this kumbaya thing where Ursay is there with Pagano, and with, with Grigson, and these guys don't get along at all, and Grigson looked like he wanted to be anywhere else but in there. And and so he kept them together another year after the 15 season with everybody kind of raising their hands together, and, and that just didn't work out. And, and once that didn't work out in the therapy that both Pagano, kind of a couple's therapy that Pagano and Grigson were subjected to, when that didn't work, somebody had to go, and that was Grigson. Well, and that was the luck time, right? Andrew Luck? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Although injured for part of the, the 15 season and then injured for part of the 16 season as well. And then yeah, all of the 17 so. season, hell, it was Scott Tolzien and Jacoby Brissett oh. the first year that Ballard was here. So uh, oh, that yeah. was not joyous. Yeah. It's always those first years uh, that, well, not always for every GM, but a lot of them have to deal with those uh, quarterback uh-huh. uh, uh transitions and uh, Ballard certainly well look it's taken a while hopefully he found his guy obviously everybody's hoping that uh, is the case all Colts fans with Richardson okay so uh so Simpson uh Abraham and we didn't talk about Abraham so matter of fact he does it's he's one of the very few uh players I think there's two of them on in this class but he's one of them that Arles does not even have a scouting report on him so what what do they like about Abraham? And I think it's important to talk about these seventh rounders and these sixth rounders because all you got to do on the Colts, because you got to do is take a look at that depth chart. Zaire Franklin, seventh round. Jalen Jones, seventh round. Rodney Thomas, seventh round. So if there's a general manager that knows how to find players in the sixth and seventh rounds, it's Ballard. So uh, what do you think he hopes he has in Abraham? I think he thinks that he's got a, a, a backup to Kenny Moore. Okay. I, I think that's what he is. I don't think in this defense, Mike Abraham can step outside 
and, and spell a guy like Juju Brents or Jalen Jones or Dallas Flowers. He's just not built like that. But he is built similarly to Kenny Moore, and he's built similarly to his dad. And, and it, I mean, his dad was a five foot, 10 inch corner who played that, that slot and played inside a little bit as a cornerback for the, for the Buccaneers. And I, I think that Ballard likes those guys who, who have a pedigree to them as well as an athleticism. And then as far as, you know, kind of those traits, he's got Kenny Moore traits where if last year, if, if they lost Kenny Moore, they were going to have a tough time spotting somebody at that slot corner position and having them okay. be in a position kind of in, in, in terms of their physicality to play that position. I think that's why they went and did it. And uh, before we uh, move back uh, to the now uh, converted safety and come out of the backfield for the last time, uh, there is still a good number of safeties, DBs that are available in free agency. Mm -hmm. uh, do you believe whether through trade or free agency, do you believe, would you be surprised if they did not add a, a really good and key contributor in free agency or through a trade before the season starts? I would be really surprised if they didn't add a free safety, some kind of veteran free safety. A couple of years ago, they did it with Mike Mitchell. Uh, after that, they did it with Rodney McLeod. If you go back to when Grigson was a GM, they did it with Mike Adams. Quinion uh, Michael or Quinton Michael back in the day with the Rams and with the Panthers was kind of that guy. You can go get veteran safeties in June, in July, maybe after final cuts, after camp. They know how to play. They know what the system is, and, and you can kind of plug and play them. I would be really surprised if they don't make a move at the free safety position, I think they will. And there are, I think it's, in my opinion, you take a look at the remaining free agents that are left all across the board. And I think safety has got the biggest names, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, Jamal Adams, um, uh, what's his name from Denver, um, even though he's going to be the, the expensive one. Uh, and you can go down the board, you know, the bills, uh, 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 safety, former Bill safety. So there's like about three or four guys that you know are just biding their time uh, and they're going to find their way on a roster and they're going to probably start for an NFL team this year. So um, did you did you have you already taken a look at that safety class of, of free agents that are available to say this guy maybe fits best with the Colts? You know, I've always done that in the past and I didn't do it this year because I'm always wrong. Like I, I'll have three guys <laughs> yeah. and Ballard will go somewhere else. I'm like, oh, that yeah, Rodney McLeod, of course. You know, yeah. or you do that. And then at the end of camp, you have cuts. And all of a sudden, there's a safety who kind of fits the traits that the Colts want. And, and they go out and they get him. So and, and Chris Ballard is not a guy who likes to lavish big money on free agents. He doesn't like to spend. This is why he's very popular with the USA family. Because Chris Ballard treats Yersay's money like it's his own. He does not spend beyond that kind of 90, 91% to the cap. And, and so as a result of that, they get to keep a lot of that money. They like that. And, and Chris Ballard's job is kind of to go after and find those, those bargain guys, not necessarily a TJ Maxx type, type guy, but bargain rack at maybe Nordstrom or Von Marr. You, you can get a clearance item that's going to wear just as nicely as something that you might have bought retail six months ago. Chris Ballard's very good at finding that piece of clothing. Yeah, let's see. I believe the uh, top safety by name, Justin Simmons, uh, yeah. Micah Hyde, I was, uh, Quandre Diggs, and Jamal Adams. Um, uh, so those are – and a, a, a bunch of other guys, but those would be the top – and then the top remaining corners, you still have Xavier Howard, Adore Jackson, Stephon Gilmore, Patrick Peterson, J.C. Jackson, and so forth. So there's there's a lot of quality players out there, but you expect that they're going to spend, they're going to spend a free safety. Yeah, and, and and Stephon Gilmore is uh, unwelcome. <laughs> yeah, I think that's just, you know, yeah, he, he begged his way out of Indianapolis, and like Ballard's not going to say, oh, now <laughs> under duress, you've changed your mind, and you're going to come yeah, back no. one year, nine million, sure. That's not the way right. the Colts operate. No. All right. So uh, let's talk about linebacker because, uh, again, uh, 
you pronounce his name? Carlisle? J- Jalen Carlisle? Yes. Jalen Carlisle. Okay. Carlisle. So and, uh, he and makes this he's work. a guy, you know, he doesn't fit as a, a, a safety. Well, he doesn't fit as a linebacker, but he does fit as a backup box at okay. safety. So he, he's kind of that guy who I think is like EJ Speed was sort of that guy coming out of Tarleton where you could get away with him at box safety. You could get away with him as a backup linebacker. You wanted to play him, and he is a really good special teams player and, and wound up playing his way into that starting ro- or that starting position when Shaquille Leonard just flat could not play anymore. Um, this is a guy, they need depth at, at linebacker, and, and so Carlisle is a guy who's going to provide that. He's fast. He's not twitchy. So he's not going to be able to cover at the safety position as well. But box safety, kind of yep. fitting in there and being a backup linebacker, being kind of that tweener, I, I think Carlisle fits that. And he looked, he looked really good in minicamp. I, I like the way he ran around. Yeah, because that's the one thing. It made a lot of sense. When I heard that they were moving him to linebacker, I was like, well, if you take a look at his scouting report, it made perfect sense because he yeah. looks like the type of player that you just don't want out in an open field. He's and, and he's right. a much better player against the run. All of his uh, best attributes are when he's in the box, stopping the run. So yes, and with his size, it makes complete sense that they would move him to linebacker. I don't think that's that they would be a better position for him with the Colts, and we'll see exactly how that works out for him. All right, but in a pinch, in a pinch, he can be run support at, at that. You know, if they go to three backers and they they drop Kenny Moore, he's that guy who can kind of fit sort of. In sort of a not a safety, not as a, a a box safety, but he's got some of the traits of a box safety. If you're if you're selling out for the run, if you're that kind of guy, he, he's he is sort of that tweener. But I think is I think ultimately he will be a linebacker. He's going to be kind of that EJ Speed guy. You're right. And and again, this is a team that what they play two linebackers like all the time or most of the time. So almost uh, all the time. Yeah. So, uh, and then Kenny Moore, I don't know. He, I mean, he's not a linebacker, but what he does in run support and what he does on, on kind of some, some exotic blitzes, he's very, very effective. So he, he's not a one trick pony slot corner. He's utilized in a number of different ways. The Swiss Ar- army knife type of DB uh, so it, it's, it's a little, it, it's not a true nickel, but it's close. Uh, do you, do you think one of the issues right now, cause you talked obviously about, uh, the need to add some more DBs, but that, that as good and effective and as, uh, especially on paper that the Colts look up front, the fact is, is they don't have enough like playmakers, you know, when you talk, talking about the back seven or, or, you know, who, whoever's back there playing against the pass and, Really, that's 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 obviously going to be something if that's going to separate, you know, a good defense or a really good defense, or you know, if you're maybe not as good, you can make up for it. Uh, who would be considered their top playmaker back there? Whoa, man. Um, maybe Nick Cross has it in him to be that, but Nick Cross, I don't know whether Gus Bradley trusts him. You yeah. know, you saw in that the last regular season game, well, last game period for the Colts but it was for the AFC South title and play one for the, for the Texans. Yeah. They hit Nico Collins over the top and that was Nick Cross. And, yeah. and so you, you've got to have somebody deep who can, who can kind of cover. He has good ball skills. Julian Blackman has good ball skills. They try to draft guys with those ball skills. But when you're, you know, you're talking about Jalen Jones, who I think was the seventh rounder, Rodney Thomas, the seventh cross, a third Blackman, a third, um, Brents was a second, so that's nice. Zaire Franklin, like you said, was a seventh. EJ Speed was down draft like a fifth, I think. You know, it, playmakers are gone by by the time the, the Colts have gotten these guys. They, they invest so heavily in the D-line and the offensive line in terms of draft equity, and they don't do enough in free agency to be able to go get guys who, who can make plays on the ball at every spot. And so when you look at like top hundred rankings in the NFL and Pete Prisco released one, I think yesterday, the Colts don't have a single guy on it on either side of the ball. 
Wow. And that's because they don't have playmakers really. With Richardson, I think a lot of guys become playmakers offensively. But on the defensive side of the ball, they're really hoping on Pay's development and on Latu being kind of playmaker ready at the other edge. And everybody else is kind of a placeholder where you just hope they make the plays they're supposed to. So he puts out, so he put out a top 100, what, best players in the NFL? Yes, for 2024, yeah. Looking and ahead he, to this coming season. And he does not consider uh, anyway. DeForest Buckner one of those guys. He was honorable mention. Taylor was honorable mention. Uh, Pittman and Nelson all in that next group of 50. So they got four it, in the top 150, but none of the top 100. Do you think it's fair how much uh, Quentin Nelson's, you know, his, uh, I don't know the right word, but, you know, the, the fact that, you know, he obviously comes right into the NFL. Everybody's thinking highly of him. Becomes one of these instant impact players. Uh, first few years, he's like the best offensive lineman, best interior lineman in the game. Um, obviously, you know, we know what's happened and things have changed, but do you think it people have been a little too harsh on his play, or do you think that he really has lost a lot from the player that he once was? I, I think it's really uh, the reason that people grade him down a little bit, at least here is that he was taken sixth overall and Josh Allen was taken seventh the year before uh, Andrew Luck retired. So <laughs> people are kind of like, well, and that's not Nelson's fault. Yeah. He didn't yeah. draft himself sixth. He is a good yeah. left guard. But And you look at the pedigree, how we learn, uh, how Colts media, Colts fans learn the game of football and, and how a roster ought to be constructed. And you look at the way Pullian did it. And he did it with edge on defense. He did it with a quarterback. He did it with Hall of Fame wide receivers. Like you can see where he was spending his money. And that left and right tackle, center also. Guards, they were kind of plug and play. You can swap those yeah. guys out. The best guard yeah. that the Colts had in the 2000s was a guy named Jake Scott. You know, okay. that's how little Bill Pullian thought of the guard position on the offensive line. That's how we learn things. Outside linebackers, they can come, they can go, whether it's Marcus Washington or Mike Peterson or Cato June. You know, they're in, they're gone, and, and you find another one of those guys. And that's the guard position on the offensive line. But Ballard wanted to go five across with really good offensive linemen, and he spent a lot of draft equity that draft on Quentin and then on Braden Smith, who he thought was going to be the right guard of the future, but he wound up shifting to a right tackle, which made a hell of a lot more sense. Yeah, that is, uh, you can see it right there. Uh, matter of fact, uh, four of the five linemen right now on the unit are either for, you know, top picks, one, two, three, uh, top three rounds. And while it's nice, and you could look back even just a few years ago when the Colts had maybe the best offensive line in football, uh, it didn't really get him that far. Uh, right. So it does show you that, yeah, it's great to have a great, like the Cowboys had it recently. The Lions have it good now. Um, but if you don't have that supporting cast, uh, it just really doesn't matter. As important as it is, and everybody knows it's very important. It's uh, you got to have, uh, you got to have the quarterback and you got to have the receivers and the skill positions and all that stuff. If you don't know that, Cowboys and Lions go to the Super Bowl, call me. Yeah, that's true, you know? too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, offensive line, let's stick on that because they went back to back. And yep. uh, but now Bordellini can, can play just about anywhere except left tackle. Uh, looks like they have him right now at right guard on the Arlads depth chart. Um, but uh, what did they see here? Again, offensive linemen. You know, it looks like the Colts have a pretty decent offensive line last year. But no, let's go bad. Third round pick, fourth round pick. Those are important picks. Let's go back to the offensive line again, even though uh, maybe there was that red flag from 2022 that said, hey, we might be in big trouble here. They, they, they were able to right the ship last year. So maybe Ballard feels he got away with it. Now let's go ahead and make sure I've got some reinforcements. You know, I, I think that a lot of uh, drafting 
uh, Tanner Bordelini out of Wisconsin was due to maybe a dissatisfaction with Wesley French as a backup center for Ryan Kelly. Ryan Kelly, 31 years old. He's getting a little longer in the tooth. He had a concussion again last year, and they don't want to take a step back. And, and with Bordellini, you can kind of plug and play him. He's really, really smart. Yeah. He can learn multiple positions. He can be your backup right guard. He could, uh, under duress, be your backup left guard. And, and so you've got a good depth piece. They brought back all 22 starters. So they weren't necessarily looking for starter-level players now, but people they could develop and people that they could use in the immediate as depth pieces. And Matt Consolvis is kind of that depth piece. I, I think that Ballard thinks he figured something out. And, and what he figured out and why they took Consolvis out of pit is that in the previous two drafts, they went and got Bernard Ryman as a potential guy, a guy with terrific athleticism and is really, really smart. And they thought that maybe he can learn the left tackle position. His rookie year, it was a little bit rough going. Second year, last year, he was really good. And this yep. year, he's going to be terrific. And then last year, they took Blake Freeland out of BYU. They tried to play him at right tackle in place of Braden Smith when Braden was hurt with a knee. That didn't go so well. But Freeland and Ryman are very, very similar in that they came into the league a little bit undersized. Last year, Ryman put on about 15 this year, Freeland's put on about 15. They feel really good right. about those guys. And then Gonsalves as the next in line as a guy who maybe can play some backup right tackle. Or, you know what, if we got our tackle situation all dialed in and Ryman and Smith are in good shape and healthy, he could rotate to guard, play some right guard, and play some Will Fries. So it, it, gives, it, it gives Tony Sperano Jr., the O-line coach, and Shane Steichen and Jim Bob Cooter, just more tools to be able to utilize on that offensive line, make sure that Anthony Richardson is protected, make sure that they got guys stacked too deep who can open up holes for Jonathan Taylor, and kind of off you go. I, this offense, I don't think the defense is necessarily going to be very good, but this offense, yeah. they, got, they got weapons, and they've got a line yep. that can really play and if Anthony Richardson can somehow find a way to stay healthy, that offense could be really, really good. They could score 30 points a game. And the, and the, the team that scored the most last year scored just under 30 a game at 509 for the 17 game season. I think the Colts can ring up points. And Steichen is a really smart offensive football coach. I think this offense healthy is going to be a nightmare for opposing defenses. Yeah, and that's because of the fact that they were able to add uh, the two uh, players that they did in the draft. Uh, Gould, who we would, we would guess that he's going to be just as valuable, if not more valuable, uh, returning kicks, especially with the new rule. Um, and then you've got Mitchell. And we were talking before we started the show. Uh, Kent and I are both in the same dynasty leagues. We had our first rookie draft uh, a couple months ago. And um, – and I, and I drafted Mitchell. I actually traded to get Mitchell before Kent picked him because uh, I knew that would happen. But um, but that's how much I like Mitchell. And I know the type of player he is. I get it. I think we all do if we've studied enough film and, and did enough research on him. Um, but I think he's worth the chance, especially with the 52nd pick of the draft. I think it's a big deal if you go, well, he's you know because he, people were thinking maybe he's first-round draft pick. Well, maybe maybe the Chiefs will take Mitchell. You know, a team like the Chiefs would take him. But then all of a sudden, or the Bills, but then all of a sudden, there's and all those questions come about. But now when you're talking about the 52nd pick, screw those questions. Yep. This is the bargain. Of course you're going to grab a guy like this at 52. And he he seems to be a, a, a well-put-together guy. There There's some questions about diabetes and how that affected his blood sugar and how the blood sugar affected then his behavior and that kind of thing. But the Colts medical guys believe that they can figure that out and that it's all going to be fine. He He's a guy, when you watch him, you look and you're like, ooh. You know, when, when you watch him, this isn't a crap all over Alec Pierce, because I like Alec Pierce. But when Alec Pierce cuts, he chops his feet, changes direction slowly. A.D. Mitchell explodes smoothly through cuts 
in a way where he gained separation. And talking to Anthony Richardson about him after minicamp, Richardson said, I know this about Mitchell. He gets open a lot. Like that's what he does. He's open. And when I throw it up, he knows how to position his body to get his hands on the ball. And the defensive player can't get his hands on it. Those are things I know about him. So I trust him and I'm going to throw him the football a lot. That that's music to my ears. I yeah. think it's music to Colts fans ears because this is a guy who is a serious weapon who Richardson already understands exactly why he's special and why he ought to get a lot of use. Yeah. You take a look at the depth chart. It just did a, how quickly going into last year's off season, last year's draft, what, what just two draft cycles can do to that receiving core because Adding these three guys, especially, of course, Downs last year and Mitchell this year, along with Pittman, because you talked about, of course, the Colts really need to find a number one guy. Pittman needs to be like a high-level number two. So I do look at Mitchell as a guy that he – I don't think Mitchell's here, and I'm not even sure that he was picked to be anything other than we see him as our eventual number one. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think they do see him as the eventual number one. I, I think they see him a, as a, a guy. And and I think that that's – I think it's good for Michael Pittman Jr. in the end. You know, I, I don't think that Michael Pittman Jr., his best I, – I don't think his best use is as like a 110-catch guy for 1,200 yeah. yards. Uh, yeah. I think he's a guy – if he tallies like 85 – and and 950 something like that i don't know why it's better for him to be used less but i think that it is and i think mitchell is one of those guys who's going to draw enough attention for Pittman that i think everybody gets fed and everybody has average yards per catch and and yak yards that are going to kind of show out and and allow these guys to kind of live their best life as nfl players despite the fact that Pittman just signed a uh, an extension I, I really wanted – what I wanted the Colts to do, because I think he's special, I wanted him to go get Malik Neighbors. Like, I, looking at tape, I fell in love with Malik Neighbors. <laughs> and, yeah. and I think that A.D. Mitchell is kind of a poor man's Malik Neighbors. I, I think that he has enough of the same traits that I think both those guys can, can do really well as NFL wide receivers, one being just a skosh more special than the other – but the other, not too far behind. Yeah, so that – was that reasonable to think that uh, Ballard would trade up in the draft? No. As he did very often? I never thought he would do that. I, but he always does something a little bit different, so I held out hope. But what Ballard does, Ballard, he says, I love them picks. And he does. And everything he does inside, you know, we all think that there's some kind of subterfuge. Every time he talks to the media pre-draft, we think, oh, he's just setting up other front offices to believe that he's going to do something that he's, uh, you know, not going to do. Yeah. But it, basically, he tells the truth. And when he says, I love them picks, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take somebody really, really special for him to move up at all. And he always points to the Jonathan Taylor. Like he moved up, what, like four spots. And this is like, uh, you know, my God, I have proven that I'm willing to put my chips out on the table and move up in the draft. Moving up from 15 to six or whatever it would have taken, I guess there were conversations about moving up, but they weren't going to go anywhere because like if Ballard's going to get over on the Vikings – somebody else is going to get over on the Vikings just a little bit less. You know what I mean? It, that was never going to happen. Yeah. If, if things don't work out for Bauer, that's going to be the thing that is going to really be the, uh, um, the, the, you know, the, the, the bad, the black spot of his resume is his inability to take chances and to just yes. say, you know what, you got to go. You don't have to do it every year. You don't even have to do it every couple of years, but at least you have to do it three or four times during your career you've been here long enough that you have to take those chances and he just hasn't taken enough of them so to win a championship uh, you have to take those chances yeah. to keep your job if you take those chances you better hit it, it's a lot like going to the casino you know i mean if you bet if you bet hard eight all night long you're yeah. gonna get you're gonna lose at craps 
But if you pick your spots and you hit hard eight enough times, you walk out with a lot of money. You know, I, I, I think that Ballard is just one of those guys who plays the pass line at the craps table and never deviates from that. He's got his system. He thinks it gives him about a 2% advantage over the house, <laughs> and he's going to stick with it all night long instead of saying, you know what, I got better things to do with my time, so I'm going to go bonsai for about a half an hour and see if I can make me some money. Well, uh, you know, you hope as a Colts fan, you look at the, the – you just mentioned it, the offense. It, it, it's it's finally looking like this offense, at least the offense, is ready to go. You've got all yep. – now, again, you don't know about Richardson. You don't, you don't know about – all these guys are very young, a lot of these guys, uh, key guys that are going to be a part of hopefully a lot of success. But if they hit, uh, it could be a scary good offense. And it, it took a while for him to put it together – but it's there, and now it just has to go, and you got to keep Richardson healthy uh, first and foremost. And then Flacco, of course, coming in is not a bad idea, all things considered. Um, before uh, I let you go, uh, taking a look at – because we went over um, every pick, but I did want to get you a little bit more on – because, it's it, again, I'm looking at it as a special teams deal, but do they look at gold as more than that? I think he's a backup for Downs, and we haven't even mentioned Downs. Downs is going to be terrific. Yeah. You know, Downs is really good as a rookie last year. He's very mature. He understands his role. He he knows how to play that role, and I think he's going to be utilized by Richardson at a really high level. And then Gould is going to be another guy very, very similar. And I, you hit on it earlier with the new rules on the kickoff. I think it places a premium on your return guy and having a guy like Gould. And I talked to, I talked to a guy on the Oregon state staff uh, about Gould and he loves Gould as a human being and, okay. and says that guy is a winner. He's going to be a winner for the Colts. You will see how good this guy can be. That is a great value pick for them, especially given the kickoff rules. Uh, Gould's going to be Gould's kind of, what Micah Abraham is for Kenny Moore, Gould kind of is for Josh Downs, except he's also going to return kicks and might be worth an extra, you know, seven, eight yards in field position because of the new rules. Uh, do you think that if they just go out and let's say they they add that key piece to the secondary um, and, and it's only one, let's say they add a free safety, one of those guys yeah. we talked about, do you, do you think that, in a best case scenario, of course, we'll talk more about this uh, during the preseason, but do you think best case scenario that this can be a, especially in this division, a, a division championship team? Sure. Hey, if Tyra Goodson holds onto the football uh, yeah. on that last offensive play for the Colts back in January, they win the AFC South. Sure. You know, that's with Gardner Minshew as your quarterback. That's with Jonathan Taylor not being around for like seven games. That's with Grover Stewart not being around for six. Now this assumes, you know, health. But if this is a yes. healthy offense, I, like I hate even saying this because I know how dumb it sounds. And I know that Jonathan Taylor and Marshall Falk. And I know that Michael Pittman Jr. isn't Isaac, or Isaac Bruce. And that A.D. Mitchell isn't Torrey Holt. I get it. But this is a really good offense that's got tools all over the place. Nobody knew that Kurt Warner was going to be the quarterback that he was. And the greatest show on turf, nobody even mentioned that at, at like before the season in 1999. Right. Yep. This is a really potentially a really, really good offense that's just going to have to outscore the opponent's offense as they go up against a defense that's going to have some holes in it. Yeah, and I guess I say that because I think most people would believe that Jacksonville is going to come back and then uh, Houston is just going to keep getting better. So the Colts are going to have to do better and not, not just one game better. They might have to be two games better than they were last year and not just wins loss wise, but just overall that if you're going to win this division next year, this year, man, you probably have to be one of the best teams in football. That's how strong the division could be. I think one of the things the Colts have going for them is one of the things they're being criticized most for, and that's for being static. They've got all 22 starters back. They've got all three specialists back, kicker, punt, punter, and long snapper. 
And they augmented all of that with a reasonably good draft class and a, a pretty good defensive tackle and maybe an upgrade at backup quarterback. I think they still need a backup running back. That's another place where I'd go get somebody, maybe cut time, go get a backup running back. But this is a team that, like, you're not hoping that that offensive line knows how to play together or that that defensive line can figure out a way chemically to kind of fit together. These guys have fit together. They are good. These guys know how to block for Jonathan Taylor. Michael Pittman Jr. knows how to catch a football from Anthony Richardson with that offensive line, with that running game, and they all know how to run block. Like these guys, these guys get being Colts. They like each other. They play for each other. They respect the hell out of Shane Steichen. Like there's a lot going for this team that was generated by their static nature during the offseason that I think can yield kind of a lift. And again, that's all contingent upon health. If Anthony Richardson separates his shoulder again or has to have knee surgery, you know, it's all over and we're talking about a different yeah. reality. Yeah. I, and I, and I feel as an outsider, I feel that this is a team to watch. Uh, I don't think there's any question, but definitely they're going to add at least one more key player in that secondary yeah. um, because you just can't have these high scoring games and, um, expect that that's going to work out with Jacksonville and Houston being better. So, uh, but I expect that that's probably going to happen. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll see how it all goes. And, uh, before I wrap up, is there anybody, because I, this is one of the few teams that I've covered during the draft process. When I take a look at the depth chart and I take a look at these rookies that were signed after the draft, uh, this is like as, as minimal of an impact of any rookie free agents that were signed in my mind. I don't really see a whole oh, yeah. lot. Um, the only the only two players that I even mentioned just jotted down, obviously Slovis being one of them because he's a quarterback and he played big time football. And then the other one, uh, I just put in on there because I know that he, he played uh, quarterback for Kansas last year and now he's a receiver, Jason Bean. But uh, it just doesn't look like this is going to be the year that uh, you know, one of those uh, uh, one of those kids is you know going to you know, be signed after the draft and end up making a team. If I were an agent, and it's probably good for some NFL players that I'm not, I, I would have told undrafted free agent guys I represent to stay about as far away from the Colts as possible, <laughs> because not only were they bringing back all 22 starters and the three specialists, there are a lot of depth pieces coming back making this roster is really going to be an uphill climb for everybody who tries. You know, you, you've had almost no change with the roster. You've added nine pieces via the draft, a couple via free agency, and you've really you lost Minshew and you lost Zach Moss, and that's it. So there's almost no attrition in this roster. So undrafted free agents who were battling for any other position but that third quarterback spot where they thought maybe Ellinger was going to be vulnerable. You know what? This is not, this is not a friendly port of call. And I wouldn't advise, I wouldn't have advised anyone to come to Indianapolis and think that they were going to get a real shot at making the roster. Makes sense. By the way, I gave the Colts, I did a a draft grade for playbook. They have their uh, yearly magazine, uh, and it, I think it's on the 30, 30, 30 year, maybe. Um, and he asked me for draft grades. I said, all right, I don't normally do that, but I was doing, of course, all of my draft stuff for the draft review guide. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll give draft grades. So I gave the Colts a B plus. I gave him the second best draft grade in the division. Uh, I think I tied with Jacksonville. Uh, um, and then the, the, the top, actually Houston, I, I think was the third, um, I gave them a C plus, but uh, I gave Tennessee the best grade in the division, but not that far behind where the Colts. So I did think they had a really good draft. Um, I know it was nine picks, but overall, I think they did a good job. And I think this is definitely a team to watch. So um, I want to also uh, let Frank know because Frank, uh, one of our viewers, and I don't know if Frank's still there. He wanted to know when the draft review comes out. Well, the draft review uh, should be out in the next day or two, Frank. So, uh, again, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the of the video, uh, the draft review guide should be ready to go. Normally, uh, Kent and I would have talked earlier in the process, but I didn't push it because I got the Colts taken away from me in the draft review process. 
this, even though I had the Colts in the draft guide, uh, they decided uh, I had too many teams, I guess. So uh, they had to share the wealth with some of the other uh, uh, members of our, our lead staff. So the Colts were one of the teams taken away from me. So that's, that's why we, we kind of did this in June and not uh, a few weeks before the draft came out and a guide came out and I was going to be a part of it. So anyway, long story short, draft review guide should be out in the next couple of days. So check that out at rleds.com. You can order it now. Uh, Kent, in the meanwhile, are we open talking about your channel? Uh, how often are you on the channel now for Colts fans who want to check you out? Because it's not just Colts, of course, right? No, no, twice every weekday. And so like today, today's a good example. Pascal Siakam agreed to an extension with the Pacers. We'll talk about that. IU basketball, we'll talk about Fever and Caitlin Clark. We talk about a little bit, but twice a day, mornings at 640. And then afternoons, not too long after we wrap up, I'll go do a, uh, a video for the afternoon. And it's 15, 20 minutes, kind of bing, bing, let's go. Uh one more thing before I let you go, and that is Indiana. Are you born and raised in Indiana, Kent? No, I'm a north suburban Chicago guy and uh, moved to Indiana, went to New Albany High School in southern Indiana for high school and uh, went to Indiana University and, and then back to Chicago and back to Indy. And I've spent the vast majority of a media career here. Uh, so when did you go to school? Uh, 80s. Okay. In the, 80s. the majority of the 80s, because I took six years. Okay. I was one of those smart guys. Well, uh, well, it's either the, it's, yeah, you, it's either you're too smart or, uh, but you know, it's one or the other. Uh, but as far as you're smart, if you can spend six years <laughs> in college, you're doing something right, even if you're doing something wrong. Yeah. Uh, so I bring that up because uh, of uh, the movie Breaking Away, which came uh -huh. out back in 1979, which is one of my favorite sports movies, a very underrated sports movie. And uh, on the Rewatchables, a very popular podcast, they were just talking about it with uh, with uh, Simmons, uh, the basketball writer. You, you know who I'm talking about. And he right, does no. that show, The Rewatchables. And yep. they were talking about Breaking Away this past week. And they were also talking about how if you were living in Indiana, you're an Indiana guy back like right around then in like the late 70s, early 80s, right maybe then. might have been just at 79 when the movie came out. They, they, they must have just talked about like 10 or 12 things that were going on in that state, in that area during that time, whether it was, you know, bird and magic, you know, the whole, yeah. uh, you know, they, they referenced so many things with what was going on in that, uh, in that state at that time that I just, I guess I just wanted to find out whether or not um, you, you kind of remember that, or you would pretty much uh, feel that that was the case that back in, 1979 or in that era that was probably one of the best and biggest moments uh, to be like an indiana sports fan or just even an indiana resident so i didn't know whether no or not question. you remember that far back you know it, it, that's right when we moved to new albany and i was in new albany high school and you, you did have like coming from lake bluff illinois nobody cared about basketball that that wasn't a thing basketball was probably if i had to rank the popularity of the sports basketball was like sixth you know, everybody played baseball. Some played football. You had tennis. You had golf. You had soccer. A lot of people played hockey, but basketball wasn't a big deal. I moved to New Albany, and basketball was everything. Indiana went undefeated in 76, won a national championship. You had Bird in Indiana State in 79. You had Louisville right across the river winning a national championship in 80. You had Indiana winning again in 81. You had breaking away. You had Fuzzy Zeller winning the Masters right during oh, that period of time. Okay. Was from New Albany. You know, it, every it, they, it they was said that like, Gretzky was playing on the minor league team in Indiana at the time. Yeah, yeah, very I didn't realize that. Yeah. yeah, and uh, Mark Messier played here a little bit. This is where his did he really? Career. Wow, yeah. like for a minute. Oh, they so they yeah. were uh, in Philly with the Oilers. Is that it? Yeah, uh, we, he played for the um, what was the Indianapolis, the Indianapolis something or others. I can't remember. I'm spacing it, but it was a WHA team at oh, the okay. time. Okay, okay. And and so you had, uh, <laughs> you know, you had those guys. You had either really really young kids or guys like Whitey Stapleton who played with the Blackhawks forever, and and then was kind of finishing up his pro career here. But a lot of stuff went yeah. on in, in those early 80s, 
uh, late 70s. And Breaking Away, you're right. Breaking Away is an awesome movie. And this is really odd, but all of the primary actors in that movie are still living. Paul Dooley is in his mid-90s. Barbara Berry, uh, they oh. both played the, uh, the, parents. the parents of, yeah. of uh, Stoller. And Dennis Christopher, uh, Quaid, you had uh, Stern and Jackie Earl Haley, uh, Robin Douglas, all still oh, yeah. living and, and most still wow. working. And that movie was made almost 50 years ago. It's just yeah. awesome. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a shame that uh, people haven't really, uh, at least the generation of today, I see so many reaction videos, sports movies and such on YouTube. And it's like, will someone... Yeah you know, watch Breaking Away, please. I mean, so many movies that these kids today just have no idea about that. Uh, it was just a tremendous movie, and I love it. It's entirely and, in Bloomington. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's yes, a time yes. capsule for the city of Bloomington, and it, it, it's just awesome. The story's great, nominated for Oscars, and yep. uh, I couldn't agree more. I think it's a fabulous film. Kent, I appreciate it as always. Uh, uh, sorry I took up some extra time, but uh, I know we don't get a chance to talk much so uh i know how busy you are and then i look forward to definitely making sure that we uh hook up again uh before the season begins uh keep fingers crossed that the colts don't have any injuries between now and then once training camp begins uh and then we can get everybody ready for the 2024 season perfect thanks greg appreciate it thanks Kent.